Okay. <clears throat> so unlike English, Greek is a language in which the grammatical functions of the words in the sentence, the nouns and the verbs, okay, is not determined by the order in which they occur, but by little suffixes that are attached to the end of them, okay, that identify all sorts of things about it. Now, we have, we have these suffixes. For example, we can talk about house or houses. We add an s suffix, and we know that it's more than one house, okay? We have other suffixes like John's or Bill's, you add an apostrophe s onto the end of a word and it designates the person who owns something. So John's house, John's bill, John's place, John's pie, <clears throat> stuff like that. So we use suffixes and we've inherited this use from uh, from the Indo-European language, languages that uh, our language belongs to. Um, but in Greek, uh, um, but in, uh, in English, unlike Greek, much of the function that suffixes have in Greek has been replaced by just a rule of sequence that certain things come first in a sentence. So we said when we were trying to define the subject that it's usually the first noun in a sentence, as in the boy gave the girl a wilted flower, okay? Um, the next thing being the verb, okay? And there are rules of sequence that people who learn English learn without necessarily knowing that they're learning them and are easy to deal with, and it just happens, okay, apparently. But in the case of Greek, as I said, all of these grammatical functions of subject, object, direct object, and in fact of possession, are indicated by little suffixes like the apostrophe s in English. Um, and, and here there are four cases, basically. There's a fifth one, but we'll talk about that in a second. And those cases have are usually presented in a certain specific order, which is the one that Belisi's given us. Nominative, genitive, dative, accusative. You notice they all end in if, okay? These, these names come from Latin, and their Latin, Latin names of them are translations of the Greek names for them. <laughs> so, so we haven't gotten very far, right? And we're, we're, we're in the cultural experience of learning Greek. So uh, um, the, the, it's better, actually, to think of these, and we've drawn a couple of lines here, as two pairs of cases, and this is very important as a structural feature. We want to think of language as a system, okay, and, and it is a system, and it's beautifully put together. And if we can understand that, it'll help us how the system works. It'll help us not only to understand, but also to remember how things work. So um, in the case of the nouns, there's a real structural contrast all through Greek between the two cases, nominative and accusative, <coughs> the subject and the object, okay, the direct object specifically, and the genitive and the dative. Um, the general, the best way I think of of describing the difference is that the, the, the nominative and the accusative are the direct cases, okay, and the genitive and the dative are the indirect ones. Um, so it's not a coincidence that you've got indirect object. You also have possession with a genitive. That's something that belongs to somebody, like Bill's house. We talked about apostrophe s. Yes, that's a genitive suffix from a Greek point of view, okay? Mm -hmm. So, so those are, those are less primary and more peripheral to a sentence. You, you actually have to have in any sentence a subject, okay? You don't have to have an object, mm -hmm. but you have to have a subject and some kind of a predicate, okay? Oh, actually, you can have invisible predicates in Greek sentences, but we'll come to that later on. <laughs> we have some sentences like that, too. Um, but anyhow, these are the f key and the basic functions of the four cases of the Greek noun, okay? And, that, and that's the standard sequence that they come in, and we'll learn more about how these cases actually work and how you use the, the functions of the cases to translate in a sentence as we go along. But at this point, we're, we're just going to stick to the basic definitions and the structural principle that contrasts each pair, subject versus object, is they're opposed, but as a pair, they're opposed to the other two, genitive and dative, which are indirect cases, and which also are opposed to each other, the genitive doing one kind of thing, and the dative another kind of things. Okay? So we'll 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 elaborate this structure. The grammatical structures are have a basic aspect and then they get elaborated, and we'll learn more about them. There's also the vocative. Belisa, you want to say a word about the vocative? Um, vocative is nice and easy. Um, 
usually, at least in the first declension, in form, it matches the nominative and the singular and the plural, so uh-huh. it shouldn't be too hard. And it's just a way of directly addressing another person or a group of people, and oftentimes it, it has a little marker next to it to let you know that it's an address, so right. it shouldn't cause you too a much A word like, oh, trouble. or right. you set it off in commas, like you, it tells you who you're talking to. Right. Right? Mm-hmm. So could you, what's a sample sentence with a vocative in it in English? Yo, man. <laughs> Hello. Yo, yo, dude. Yo, dude. Yeah. <laughs> Do this. Dude is evocative, right? Mm-hmm. It's not a subject or an object. It's just designating the addressee of the message, right? right? Mm-hmm. All right, great. Okay, so now we're going to look at the Greek, uh, um, a, a class of Greek nouns. These classes of nouns are called by a word that's a little bit confusing. There are, there are three classes of nouns, the first, the second, and the third declension nouns, and they all have uh, endings, case endings, that are um, specific, that are related to one another, okay, and that are different from one another. The difference in, the, in them is only formal. There's no difference in the function of those cases, but they're formally different, okay? So it's like you had one way of say, making the plural of a noun in one group of nouns, okay, and another in another. In English, we only have plurals with an S and plurals with nothing, like one deer, many deer, right? <laughs> But um, in Greek, it's more complicated, all right? So, so what we, we start out with learning is the first declension nouns, and, and the, the number of first is uh, basically arbitrary. It's, there's for, there are first, second, and third ones. The first and second are easy. The third one is more, and it's relatively simple. The third one is more complex, so we're going to learn them in that order. So here are the forms. Belisi's written them down, okay? The first one, which is the same both for the nominative and the vocative, we've simplified the names of the cases to N, G, D, and A, and V for vocative, okay? And the endings you note change between the singular and the plural, okay? So the first uh, form, the nominative singular of this noun, techne, which in Greek, by the way, means art or skill, okay, that's kind of the base form of the whole Paradigm. Paradigm means a listing of, of uh, forms of words. Okay, in 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 studying Greek, it's an important thing. A paradigm is a is a little list like the one on the blackboard, that uh, that is a, a conceptual grammatical unit. Okay, um, so w- what we do is we learn one noun for a class, and that way we learn a bazillion nouns. Okay, at least we separated them out into three classes, and there are a lot of nouns just like techne. So if you memorize one, you memorize a lot, okay? Yeah. And you can identify them if you know what class they belong to. So techne, and then the genitive is technase, where you add an S. We've got suffixes in English that you add S. So it's not a sign of the plural here. It's a sign of possession. So techne by itself tells you that that noun is a subject of the sentence. If you have an S on the end of it, technase, it, means, it says it means of art or of skill, okay? Then techne with the iota subscript, notice that it's written under the letter, and it's not our convention to pronounce it, but it's fundamental, right? If we didn't have that iota subscript, we couldn't tell that it was different from the nominative, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to really pay attention. There's a huge difference between a subject of a sentence and an indirect object, right? You all agree. Mm -hmm. So techne means to or for. That's what an indirect object does, okay? It's the person or, or thing to or for which you do something, okay? Um, and then the last one in the singular column is technane, where the n is the suffix, okay? And, um, and there you are, that means that's a direct object, so, so that will be the direct object of a sentence. Um, in the plural, the functions of the cases are the same, as only you're talking about more examples of it. So technai, technon, technais, technos. You may notice that Greek words, um, so far anyway, uh, and generally with vowels, and sometimes with words like, with consonants like S and N, okay? There aren't a whole lot of words that, that a lot of sounds that Greek words can end with. So um, the, 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 the suffixes are relatively simple. Most of them are vowels, and a few are, have these consonants after them, okay? So what are you going to do with that? You're going to memorize it. <laughs> technai, technais, technai, technain, technai, technon, technais, technos, okay? There's also one thing to notice about the thing that Ulysses just remarked about the accent, okay? 
we're, we're going to learn more about how words are accented uh, in this coming week, okay? But you notice that the accent of all the forms is the same, that is, it's on the epsilon of techne, except in the genitive plural. And this is true of all nouns of the first declension. The genitive plural of all first declension nouns is own with a circumflex over the omega. Um, there are historical reasons for that. That com it comes from a own. It was originally techna own, and when the when the vowels there, the alpha and the omega, contracted into one, you get because you had a rising tone on the alpha, and the tone goes down on the next syllable, it became a circumflex. Okay, so we've got that everywhere. All right, so there's the first declension noun. That's what we want to learn. Bye. Enjoy. <laughs> Bye. Okay.